Glenn is an ugly loser who specializes in treating freaky monster girls. With his medical degree in Rees, he uses suspicious methods to give his patients a treatment that leaves them wanting more. A long time ago, humans and monsters were sworn enemies, almost wiping each other out in a war. But as the years went by, no one could remember what they were even fighting about, so they decided to live in peace. In the present, a young human doctor, Glenn, enjoys rubbing his cowgirl patient, who makes happy noises for him. But when he tells her she's expecting, she remembers she has a husband and runs to him. Then, his partner, Sappy, comes in to congratulate them. But she later tells him that he can't continue to mess around with married monsters. Suddenly, they hear a knock on the door, and when he opens it, he receives a request from Dr. Tully. And when he remembers her large cannons, they immediately leave to help out at an arena. When they arrive, a group of monsters, led by Tasselia, welcome them, and he explains that he's come to examine them before they fight. So she shows him her large melons and introduces herself as the Harris of Cynthia Transportation. Then the monsters line up outside their tent while he examines their bodies, and when it's her turn, she begins to strip and show him her full package. While she tells him that she's looking for the right partner, preferably a doctor, to have kids with. After hearing this, Sathy interrupts and tries and to distract Glenn from her fat ass, but he focuses on his job and declares her perfectly healthy. Later, two of Tessalia's attendants, Kai and Morna, approach them to ask about her health, but when he tells them that she's perfectly healthy, they look even more concerned. That night, Sathy slithers into his room, and when she asks him why he won't come to bed, he remembers his conversation with the centaurs and how they revealed that Tessalia had suddenly become a miserable loser, even with that fat ass, and thought that an illness might be the cause. Then he tells her that he suspects Tessalia might be hiding the real cause of her losing streak, so she gets him a drink to calm down. But when he notices that she added special ice for him, she tells him she'd climb mountains for him to feel better, but he can't tell that she's simping hard. So when he says he intends to visit Tessalia the following day, she wraps around him tightly and says she doesn't want to share him with anyone, but he uses his doctor Rees to get her to agree to be the third wheel. The next day, Tessalia loses yet another match, and as she walks off, she wonders why she's so useless, so she goes back to practicing how to penetrate her opponent with her long tool, but as she finishes, she sees Glenn and her assistants, and he tells her the reason she sucks is that she has dirty and unbalanced hooves and needs some horseshoes. However, she tries to resist, saying she's proud of her body the way that it is, but the girls hold her down, and he tells her he's about to get started. Even though she screams from the fear of the pain, he gets under her and examines her dirty hooves, so she tells him it's her first time and to do it gently, but he assures her he knows his way around and gets to work. After getting her ready, he's about to give it to her, but she is scared of his tool entering her hole. So Safi uses her tail to wrap around her, giving her something to suck on, while Glenn pounds his nails in for multiple rounds. The next day, they watch as Tessalia continues her winning streak, and as she wins a fourth time, she turns to him to thank him, and Safi almost chokes him for staring at her large melons again. In a flashback during the war, Safi was taken hostage by Glenn's family at a young age, as their parents secretly worked together to establish a trade route, so her presence was the only way to make sure they wouldn't be betrayed. But after the war ended, there was no reason for her to stay, so they were sad to leave each other, in the present. Safi is grateful that she and Glenn were able to find each other again in med school, just as he checks on her and asks if her sunblock ointment needs to be replaced, which she confirms. Later, as they take a boat ride, he asks how others of her kind survive, and she says they're mostly nocturnal, but as she tries to flirt with him, he tells her to control herself since they're only going to get supplies. Then Aquaman welcomes them to the Marrow waterways and pulls their boat to their destination as they look around the town and admire Lady Skatie's efforts to unite the monsters and humans. After they pick up the supplies, she tells the merman to take them to a nearby gift shop, and he knows she's about to spend his money on some random bullshit. But after going through the entire market, she only buys a small glass bottle and says spending time with him is the real gift, which he thinks is corny. On the way back, a cute mermaid girl calls their attention and introduces herself as Lulala, and asks them to pay for her singing, but he gets distracted by her tiny chest, so Safi licks him to get his attention, telling him he's a sick man. So Lulala tries to get to the bag by telling them the story of the bridge nearby, where two lovers unlive themselves, making the spot a blessing for lovers, but he wonders what kind of fucked up love these mermen are into. So he asks for two songs but tells her he'd pay for the second by observing her body 
and since she's a kid, she agrees and starts to sing. But she suddenly stops and starts to clear her throat. After seeing her condition, he offers to conduct the examination immediately and tells the merman to take them somewhere more private. Once they get there, he tells her to open her mouth, and he holds his tool up to look inside, and after he notices some swelling, he tells her he wants to see her chest, and she starts to sense that he's a creep, but he convinces her he just wants to check her breathing. After checking, he asks to examine her gills and finds it strange that they're open on land, so he inserts two fingers to check how wide they are. He tells her he's going all in, but she screams from the pain of it being too tight, and he realizes they're not wet enough. As he continues to go deeper inside her, he struggles to determine where the primary cause of her inflammation is, but he finally pulls out when he sees she's wet enough. Then he finds out she spends more than half her day on land, and warns her it's too dangerous for her health, questioning why she'd put herself through that. But she tells him that a privileged man like him couldn't understand what it's like to have to take care of her family since her father left to buy milk. So he decides to tell her his diagnosis. But before he can, a little kid falls in the water, and the currents drag him under. But the ugly fisherman says the boat would be destroyed if he tried to help. Without hesitation, Lulala jumps in and manages to get to him in time, even though she struggles to breathe underwater. So she manages to bring him ashore and Glenn immediately starts car. But when no one is looking, she slips back into the water unconscious. When the kid wakes up, he recommends she take him to a human doctor, and she thanks him. But Safi realizes Lulala is gone, and Glenn jumps in after her. Since mermaids have been known to drown in the past due to similar inflammations, he desperately tries to reach her, and when he does, he blows air through her mouth to try and reactivate her gills. Once it works, he begins to pass out from losing too much air, but luckily, Safi uses her fat tail to lift them out of the water just in time, but separates the two when she sees he's holding onto her for too long. Later, they watch her sing at the Capitol, and when the show's over, she swims over to them to thank them, but feels embarrassed when she sees Glenn and tells him she owes him her singing career and swims off. That evening, Frankenstein's bride chases down Obi-Wan Kenobi, but stops when she sees she's been led into an ambush with the low-budget Jettas, and as they charge forward to attack, she brings out her knife to take them on. The next day, Glenn and Sethi continue their usual practice and help a slime girl maintain her form with a special bio-liquid, and he tells her she can continue to use it for her treatment, making her blush at his kindness. After watching her roll off in her bathtub, Safi commends him on his brilliant idea to use hot spring therapy as his inspiration, and this puts him in a good mood. So she closes the door behind them so they can have a private moment. However, before they can get freaky, they hear a knock at the door, and when it opens, Lady Skatey walks in. Even though Lindworm is a fairly new city, no other city has been able to pull off the bond between the monsters and the humans quite like Lindworm, which is rare since it's only been 10 years and is an achievement credited to Lady Skady of the Rare Dragon Race, making her the most powerful person in the city. So Glenn wonders what would bring such a high-profile person to his clinic, but no sound comes from her mouth when she tries to respond. Then her bodyguard, Kunai, walks in and tells them she'd help relay her words. So Kunai continues on Skady's behalf and tells them she lost her arm in a battle with some bandits and requires them to find the arm and reattach it. When she mentions that she took on 10 slagers before she gave up and ended up losing her arm, he asks why they came to his clinic instead of his mentor, Dr. Tully, who she's already quite close to. But she tells them that she tried to get her help, but was declined immediately, and referred to him instead. While Safi curses Tully for ruining their moment, Glenn asks what kind of monster Kunai is, and Skadi explains that she's technically not a monster, but is a flesh golem made from parts of human corpses as part of an experiment by a doctor from the Far East. It surprises him that anyone would try to artificially create life, and Skadi tells him that Kunai hates doctors as a result, so they wonder how they're supposed to deal with her. After Skadi leaves, Kunai tells them that she doesn't plan on accepting their help, but Safi assures him that she's probably all bark and no bite. Then she tells her they don't usually deal with creepy occult cases like hers, and should lower her expectations, but she says that's literally the story of her life and she doesn't want their help. Even though they remind her it's a request from Skadi, she insists that she can find her arm on her omen leaves, and when she heads into town, she sees Obi-Wan again and decides to follow him. Back at the clinic, Safi says her irrational attitude is probably what lost her arm in the first place, but he thinks that her sloppy stitching was because the doctor was troubled mentally and technically. 
so he decides to go out and look for her arm since he can't abandon his patient, while he leaves Safi in charge of the clinic with the help of the fairies. Meanwhile, Kanai runs through an alleyway but can't find the man she was tailing, till he suddenly emerges and knocks her out. Back in town, Glenn walks around aimlessly as he realizes his dumbass didn't ask where she fought the bandits, but he hears a scream and rushes to find Tessalia, as she points him to a detached leg in the middle of the road. So he examines the leg and determines that the stitches must have ripped due to a strong impact, but when she asks how he can be so calm about the detached leg, he tells her it belongs to Kunai, and she recognizes the name. At the same time, Kunai crawls through the alleyway but doesn't get far before she gives up on finding help. But as she rests, she begins to feel pleasant stroking on her missing leg, as she struggles to control herself. Meanwhile, Tisulia tells him that Kunai used to be a famous fighter, who held the record for most consecutive wins, which eventually landed her the gig with Scatty, so it's surprising that she could be defeated like this. But he tells her that she was probably caught off guard and points out the fact that her stitches were pretty old and degraded too. But as the leg moves in response to his fondling, he continues to rub it some more, and when she observes that he looks like a pervert, he tells her not to mention it to Safi. In the alleyway, Kunai figures it's Glenn who's probably feeling her up, so she laments her curse to feel all the body parts separately, and even hear the voices of the humans they previously belonged to. Meanwhile, Glenn continues to look around for her and her right arm, but the people stare at him like he's a sick man. Then, Lulala pops up and tells him the whole town thinks he's gathering body parts for an experiment. But when he explains that it's actually for his patient, she pulls out the arm she found floating in the waterways, so he begins to clean up her arm, while Kunai continues to feel tingly, and when he's done he says he needs to find her main body, so she suggests asking the body parts, and when she does, they begin to point the way. Later, he finds Kunai spread out on the floor and tells her he'd be able to reattach her parts immediately. But when she tries to refuse, he says he's already been touching her all over, and might as well continue. So she notices his needle, and when she asks what it's for, he explains that he'd use it to attach her blood vessels, which her creator didn't do since he was probably a quack. But what she tells him, it's a waste of time since she's just a flesh column. He says that her body parts will continue to belong to other people if they don't connect them properly. So she finally agrees but tells him that she doesn't sense any pain and he doesn't need to be delicate but he tells her she looks miserable, for someone who doesn't feel pain and that it's his job to lessen her suffering. And when she realizes that he actually gives a shit, she smiles. Back at the clinic, Arania's Sappy's drinking buddy with even bigger melons, shows up to finally meet Glenn, but when she finds out he's not there, she drops off a mysterious basket, and as she turns to leave, she asks Safi if she thinks Glenn is cheating on her, but Safi tries to stab her with a spoon. Meanwhile, as Glenn goes deep into Kunai, he asks her to move her skirt out of the way so he can finish up. But she's barely able to hold it together as she gasps for air, so he spreads her legs wider and gets the job done, making her burst with excitement. Afterward, she tells him she'll never forget what he's done for her and leaves, while one of the masked men watches from behind and turns to the other masked men in hiding. Later, Glenn returns home and is welcomed by the fairies, who ask for some milk, and after he gets it to them, he searches for Safi, and when he finds her, she tells him she's pregnant. In a flashback, Glenn looked devastated to see Safi leave, but he realized he now had a thing for monsters and decided to become a monster girl doctor. So he went to medical school where he met Dr. Tully and reunited with Safi, which eventually led him to open his clinic with her and have her tell him she's pregnant. Since he's sure he always uses protection, he tells her that's impossible and that Lamia's only lay eggs, so he asks what she's hiding under her skirt. Then she lifts it up and reveals the box Arania gave her earlier, which turns out to have an egg inside, but when he holds it, he tells her it's an unfertilized egg from a harpy and puts it back. Suddenly, Sapphire picks up the heat signature of five hooded men, and the fairies announce that they have intruders. So the men charge forward and kick the door in, but Safi uses her strong tail to send one of them smashing into the wall. But when the rest try to confront her, they find that she's disappeared. Outside, they make a break for it, and when he asks if she knows who they are, she says they probably thought he was working with Kunai since they were dumb enough to break in with her there. So he realizes that they must be the slavers Lady Skatey mentioned. And when Safi realizes they would have taken him hostage, she displays her demonic face, which makes him want to shit his pants. So they decide to head to the Central Council to discuss with Kunai. 
but she suddenly appears behind them with one of the slavers and explains that she had been tipped off about where the slavers were headed. Then she throws her to the ground, and when he bends to check her, Kanai explains that they had been illegally trafficking harpies and forcing them to lay eggs, which they sold to humans with perverted tastes. So he shows him the egg with Safi, and she confirms that it's one of theirs, and they would definitely be coming after them. But when Safi asks if they could get the protection of the council patrols, she says that wouldn't be possible as she pulls at her knife and disarms one of the slavers behind her, and sucker punches him, sending him flying till he falls on his ass. After, she tells them to come with her, and as they advance she explains that the patrols have been working on an operation to expose the slavers, which is why they can't protect them, and says their best bet is to stick with her even though she's about to infiltrate their hideout. When they reach the waterways, they see Lulala and wonder what she's doing there. But Kunai says she'll explain on the way. He's also surprised to see Lady Skatey on the boat, but she remains emotionless. But when Safi asks why Lulala is towing the boat, she explains that it was part of the deal they made in exchange for allowing her to sing at the Central Council Hall, and she now tells them on their mission. Upon hearing this, Glenn expresses his displeasure over taking advantage of Lulala's poverty. But when Kunai tries to interrupt, he tells her to shut the fuck up and translate for Lady Skatey. So she admits that though it seems that way, Lulala was perfect for the job since they could talk to her without raising suspicion and that she was being handsomely rewarded. But when he continues to insist that she's only recovering from her illness, Lulala interrupts and tells him that he's not her father and she can decide for herself. After, Kunai explains that the patrols are waiting to storm the hideout from the front while they'd infiltrate from behind and save the harpy girls. However, as they approach the bridge, a couple of slavers appear with bows and arrows and start to shoot at them. So they lower their heads while Kunai rushes forward to block their attacks with her sword but can't keep up with how many arrows they're firing. Suddenly, Tisolia comes to the rescue, along with Kai and Morna, who knock some of the men aside, allowing the boat to go forward. Then they face off against the slavers, who recognize Tessalia's family name and say she should understand them since they're also mercenaries and claim that monsters and humans should hate each other. But Tessalia disagrees and insists that nothing in Lindworm suggests that and its people live in peace. This angers the man and he rushes forward to attack, but she uses her long tool to take him down as she targets the rest to deal with. At the hideout, the four get out of the boat and tell Lulala to get to safety, but as they're about to head in, Green Arrow shows up to stop them, and Kunai figures that he's the ringleader and tells him that he'll have to answer for his crimes, so he attacks, and they exchange powerful sword attacks. When she gets a chance, Kunai tells Lady Skatey to get to the girls while she holds him off, but he warns her that it may not be the brightest idea to send her into the hideout crawling with his men. In response, she says Lady Skatey is even more badass than she is, and at that instant, the patrols begin to charge inside just as Lady Skatey continues forward and knocks one of the men aside with her dragon tail. Then they stop at a door, and when they open it, they find the harpies inside, so Blen assures them they're here to help and mentions he's a doctor. Upon hearing this, they show him that one of them has something wrong with her stomach, so he calls for Sappy's help, and they lay her down and give her a cloth to bite on, while he tells her he's about to touch her and she should indicate when she feels pain. So he inserts his hand under her covers, and after feeling around, he concludes that she has an egg stuck inside of her that they need to remove immediately. Next, he ships her panties to the side and puts his hands back in to rub a suspicious part of her body, making her rock back and forth gently. Immediately, the slavers storm the room, but Safi and Lady Skatey hold them off, while Safi monologues that she has an incurable illness that she's keeping from Glenn and she comes from a clan that specializes in assassination techniques so she was tasked with taking out his family if their negotiations in the past had fallen through. While she tries to shield Glenn, one of the slavers stabs her with a poison blade and slowly loses consciousness as he continues to rock the harpy. When she comes to, she sees Glenn and notices they're in a strange room, and he explains that the poison they used wasn't enough to take down Elenia, and that was the only reason why he didn't leave the girl he was rocking to help her. After she buys the cap, he informs her that all the slavers have been arrested, and a harpy was able to lay her egg safely, which makes her happy. So she summons the courage to tell him about her assassin background, but he tells her he always knew about it, since his dad thoroughly researched their family and even confesses that she had also been accidentally poisoned when she was a kid, which was the first time he ever researched medicine to help someone. As he continues to dial up the Rees, 
Safi is no longer able to resist her urges and ends up binding his arms and laying him on his back while she begins to undress, as he warns her that she'd lose her job at the clinic if she continues, but she ignores him and tries to further the plot, but suddenly becomes weak and falls to the side. Relieved, he tells her to rest till the poison's effect is fully gone, so she tells him to hold on to her tail till she's able to fall asleep and remembers that her incurable disease is because she met him. The next day, they enter the Harpies' village with Tassinalia pulling their carriage, and as Safi laments that Dr. Tully's demands are getting even more ridiculous, he agrees that it's strange that she wanted them to do checkups on the Harpies in their village, but wants to know how Illy's doing. So Safi tells him that she has no family in the village and has lost too many feathers, making her unable to fly. At the same time, Tassilia struggles to continue pulling their carriage even with her fat ass, but is determined to show Glenn just what her horsepower can do, even though her attendants warn her she'll smell too much of desperation. Along the way, she hears a rumbling sound and a rock slide comes rolling toward her, so they rush to protect her, and when Glenn and Safi hear all the commotion, they rush out to find three of them on the floor. While she and Morna are alright, Kai struggles to stand and eventually falls right back to the ground. So he examines her and concludes that she might have a sprain or fracture, and they would need to get to the village before he can conduct a proper examination. Just then, a group of harpies fly to them and tell them they've come to escort them to the village, so he informs them of Kay's injury, and they agree to carry her ahead. Later, they arrive at the village and find that it's peaceful and full of laughter, but when Staffy begins to look uneasy, he gives her his coat to make her feel better. After, Yoda shows up to thank them for coming. And when he brings up Kay's injury, he confirms that they've been experiencing some strange rumblings lately, but is glad his men were able to get there in time. So Glenn asks where she is, and they tell him she's in a guest house that they prepared for him to conduct his examination, while Tesselia says she'll stay and discuss business with the Elder. At the guest house, he confirms that the injury is a sprain and tells her she needs bed rest, yet after hearing it's not broken, she tries to stand up and fails as Safi tells her that it'll take longer to heal if she keeps moving. Although she's reluctant to agree, Warnett assures her that she'd be able to attend to Tesselia alone, which puts her at ease. Outside, the harpies line up for their checkups, just as Glenn finishes attending to one with a damaged wing and is overwhelmed by the turnout on the first day. Just then, the girls from the slaver's hideout show up at the window to thank him for his help. But when he asks where Illy is, they say she doesn't want to see him which surprises him since everyone loves him after he touches them. Later, he walks through the village and finds Lorna staring at a river alone, which seems strange, so he asks why she's alone at first she says she's with Tessalia. But when she looks around, she realizes they've been separated, so she asks about Kai, and he tells her she's doing well, then asks what their relationship is like. Her mood changes, as she reveals they're both war orphans, which is common for centaurs since they're mostly mercenaries so they end up taking such children as attendants or soldiers, which is how they ended up serving the Scythia family as Tessalia's attendants. Then Tessalia arrives and asks her where she's been, saying that she had suddenly wandered off, but Lorna has no idea what she's talking about. Later that night, as Tessalia stuffs her face, she tells them that Lorna has been acting strangely since they got to the village and has been messing up all of her duties, including making a decent meal, which is why she's happy to be eating Safi's food. After she devours five more plates, she tells them Lorna was also saying unthinkable things in the meeting with the Elder, and when they ask why they were meeting with him, she explains that the company is planning on including an air courier division and is negotiating the possibility of employing harpies for that purpose. Upon hearing this, they're impressed with the idea, but she expresses concern over Kay's injury and Lorna's strange behavior and asks him to examine Lorna too. However, he doesn't think it's necessary since he suspects Warren is just worried about Kai, but she refuses to take no for an answer as she's unable to do anything by herself and brings out the finest white wine to bribe them, which causes Safi to agree. Later, Glenn searches through his books and laments that there's not much he can do to help since Lorna is just worried about Kai, who needs more time to get better, so she points out that Kai seems fine without Lorna and he says that it might be because of their different personalities. Then she has an idea of how to deal with Lorna since she's sensitive, and he's finally able to find something to use from his books. Later, Lorna feels bad that she's become completely useless without Kai, and continues to battle her anxiety toward her duty till Glenn calls out to her to ask how her new blindfold makes her feel, and she says she's beginning to feel calmer. So he kicks things in gear and binds her hands and legs in a bondage suit 
while pulling her back, and when he asks if he's going too hard, she tells him it would be better to give it to her harder. This makes Safi uncomfortable as she wishes he'd share his tricks with only her. But he assures her that he's only realigning her bones to improve her posture, which also doubles as discipline for centaurs. So Warna says she's feeling much better, and Safi is surprised at how effective the session was, but Glenn hints that she's probably into some freaky shit. After Tassalia thanks him for his help and embraces Lorna now that she's better. But when Safi asks if she's really going to walk around looking like an escort, Lorna says she'd do anything for Tassalia's sake. Later, they visit Kai, who is surprised to see her naughty interest out in the open. But when she says it was all Glenn's idea, Kai suggests that they show him their appreciation. So Lorna pushes him between Kay's melons, which are bigger than his head, and she tells him to do whatever he likes with them, as they both whisper in his ears. Then they guide his hands to their horsepower and tell him that if he marries to Salia, they would also become his. <laughs> Since he's never done it with two centaurs at once, he panics and backs away, while they laugh and say they were only teasing, but tell him that they look forward to being his servants. Some days later, Glenn examines Kay's leg and tells her she should be fine, and they all breathe a sigh of relief. Then Safi says Illy is the only thing still keeping them in the village, since she keeps refusing an examination. While Glenn wonders if he rocked her too hard the last time, Tisilia tells him she has something to discuss with him. So as they head out, he discovers that Illy wants to see Tisilia in exchange for the examination. But when he asks if she knows why, she tells him she has no clue. When they reach Illy's house, they open the door and find bloody feathers all over the floor, with her sitting in the corner under a blanket. He tries to ask her questions about her case, but she continues to give him cold responses till she sees Tisalia and agrees to cooperate so she can talk to her. So he examines her wings and pulls on her feather, which makes her squirm from the pain. Then he examines her head and notices her reaction. And finally, he shoves his hands beside her melons, which makes her freak out. But he says he only wants to feel her temperature and proceeds to feel her up. So Safi picks him up and slams him to the floor for being so rough with a young girl while Tisalia rushes to his side to make sure her future groom can still function. That Illy asks what her diagnosis is, and he tells her she's not sick at all, and she's just shedding and growing new feathers, assuring her she'll be able to fly in no time. But she suddenly has an angry outburst, and insists that there must be a bigger reason why she can't fly since she's never had this problem when she shed her feathers in the past. As he tries to reason with her, she continues her tantrum and tries to kick him away. But Tassilia uses a broom to block her attack and tells her to apologize, but she runs away instead. As they all wonder what was with the shit show, he says it's not uncommon behavior since harpies have bird brains, so they plan to follow her. But Tassilia tells them to leave it to her instead. Later she finds her sitting by the riverside and asks why she wanted to see her in the first place. So Illy asks if she's really a gladiator in the arena. And when Tassilia confirms this, she says she used to watch fights from the roof when she was a kid and wants to be a gladiator too since she's good at fighting. But when Tassilia tells her that being a gladiator is more about skills and technique, she insists that all that matters is who can beat Clobber their opponent. So Tassilia picks up a stick and tells her to show her what she's got, and Illy warns her not to come crying if she gets hurt, but she tells her that she's about to teach her some manners. Later Glenn treats Tassilia's wound while she laments that Illy resorted to underhanded tricks, and when they ask her how she managed to injure her, with no combat experience. She tells them that she made sure she beat her with her stick in return, which makes Safi happy that she got what she deserved. However, he says that they have to find a way to help her, and Tisalia remembers the beating she handed to her as she told her she should forget about being a gladiator and focus on living peacefully in the village. But after hearing this, she said something just didn't feel right about staying in the village, even though she didn't have anywhere else in mind to go. This made Tisalia conclude that Illy had to resolve her issues on her own, especially since she never made an effort to fit in. So they figured that her interest in being a gladiator was probably an excuse in fear that once her feathers finished shedding, she'd fly off and risk being kidnapped by another set of slavers. At this, Tisalia hands him a large feather that fell off from Illy during their fight, and when he looks at it, he tells them he'd need their help with a treasure hunt. The next day, they gather all her feathers that they can find while Tassilia tells her that he's the only one that can help her now. Immediately, Safi arrives with a large basket full of feathers, and he tells her they can't possibly all be allies, but she says that she was too distracted by the sound of him cheating on her. As she walks away upset, Tassilia tells him to give her more attention since the weather in the village doesn't favor Lamias, 
and when he notices that she's acting out, he agrees to be more careful. Suddenly, a harpy lands beside them and tells them that they can't find Illy anywhere, as she's probably left the village, so they promise to search for her. Meanwhile, Illy remembers what it was like when she could fly anywhere she wanted to but suddenly lost the ability to. In the present, she stands on a tall tree in an attempt to fly again, but realizes that she just can't do it, and remembers her conversation with Desalia, who told her she couldn't keep flying forever and had to choose where to land. Meanwhile, the three of them search for her, and Safi picks up on her body heat from far away, and Tessalia goes ahead, while he commends her on her incredible abilities. When they catch up to them, they find Illy refusing to come down, and when she spots him, he tells her that his diagnosis wasn't entirely accurate, and that though she's actually molting, after gathering all of her fallen feathers, he realized why she hasn't been able to fly. Back in the city, Dr. Tully admits to Lady Skatey that she knows Illy isn't sick, but decided not to tell Glenn to see if he can figure out what's really wrong. In the forest, Glenn tells her that she's currently growing a different set of adult feathers that will be different from everyone else's because she actually has phoenix blood inside her and that she'll definitely be able to fly again and be reborn with fiery wings again and again, and this gives her hope. The next day, she shows him her new set of wings, and he tells her that she should allow them to grow some more. Then he asks why she didn't want him to examine her in the first place, and she gets embarrassed and mentions that it was because he saw her lay her egg and runs off. So they watch her show off the remaining harpies, and when she flies off, one of her feathers comes loose, and he tries to catch it but gets burnt by how hot it feels and figures that the phoenix blood must run strongly through her. Later, he teaches the villagers tips on how to take care of their feathers and demonstrates on one of the girls as she makes happy noises. And when he asks if anyone else would like to be used for the demonstration, all the girls rush to him and smother him. Afterward, they get ready to go back to Lindworm. But Illy comes flying through the window with a suspicious sticky substance on her, saying she was flying through the forest when she suddenly got it all over her. Since he's familiar with sticky substances, he touches it to see what it is, then he determines it's more like thread than liquid and guesses it's from an arat, a half-human half-spider. So he tells her to wash off in the hot springs, and she flies out immediately, but pops her head back in to invite him to join her making Safi mad, and when she leaves, she gets a bad feeling about it. Later three more girls come to see him with the same sticky substance on them, and he realizes that he'll have to track down the arat to permanently stop the problem. So they head through the forest, but he gets tired, which causes Safi to carry him up. Then they notice a couple of threads, which means they're on the right path, so he asks her if her clothes were also made by Arakans, and she confirms they are the only ones who can make clothes that block sunlight. This makes him marvel at their talent, but she warns him that they are best at making traps, so he should stay alert. Just as she says this, he walks right into a trap and gets tied upside down, and she realizes that this will alert the monster. Immediately, Orania appears. And when she recognizes Safi, she asks what she's doing up in the mountains. And when Safi explains the situation, she gets excited to meet Glenn and introduces herself as Safi's best friend. Then Safi tells him that she's the lead designer at one of the best sewing companies in the world, and all her clothes were designed by her. So he introduces himself and asks what brings her to the forest as well. That she says she heard about the harpy with phoenix feathers and was hoping to use her magnificent feathers as inspiration for a new design hoping to see them in person. When she says she set traps to catch the harpy, they inform her that she doesn't live in the wild, but in a village. Later, Illy rests on a roof when she spots Arania, who has a perverted look in her eye that she only enjoys from Glenn. Immediately, she jumps on the roof, which puts Illy on edge as she refuses to show her the feathers, making Arania beg for it. Meanwhile, Tisselia practices her fighting when she sees Illy and Arania, coming through as Arania launches her webs to catch her. Back at the riverside, Safi says she made Arania promise not to leave webs all over the place, which should solve the problem. But just then, Tisselia comes up to them covered in her webs, complaining and asking what the fuck just happened to her. So Safi explains that she's her best friend, but Tisselia says that she has terrible tastes in friends and shouldn't be letting her run free. However, Sapphire continues to defend her. Even though Tisselia says her instincts tell her that she can't be trusted, then, Glenn interrupts and says that she only wants a look at Illy's wings, but when she asks them if they're sure about that, they say that they don't need to worry since someone as strong as her is around. Then Safi suddenly heads inside, and Tessilia says she must be tired from the cold, and when he says he didn't notice, she tells him that he's pretty dense for a doctor. 
That night, he tells her that he's giving her a break and that Kai and Morna are inviting her to the hot springs to relax. So he tells her to consider it his gift to her, and she gladly accepts the offer. Somewhere in the village, the elder sends off three of his men on some type of mission, and he looks sad to see them go, while Safi finally gets into the hot springs and relaxes with the girls. Back at the house, the fairies help him clean up and put away his equipment, when they suddenly fly away to hide, as Araniab comes in but notices that Sappy's not around. So when he asks what she needs, she says her head feels fuzzy and her joints aren't working well. So he feels her temperature and determines that she doesn't have a fever. Then he sticks his tool in her mouth but can't see any problems there either, but suggests she might be coming down with a cold. As he notes his observations, he notices that she's staring suspiciously, but when he asks, she says that she's stunned that a human actually cares about treating monsters, and now understands why Safi's got it bad for him. Then she says she's heading outside for some air, and he warns her not to stay out too long in the cold, so she invites him to come with her if he's that worried. After they've headed far inside the forest, he suggests they go back, but she continues to go farther, so he tells her that he'd be going back himself, but when he turns to leave, he sets off one of her traps and wonders when she set it up. Then she confesses that she set the trap to keep him from leaving and lied about her feeling sick, just so they could have a little fun. When he points out that they're not even close, she admits that she's not really attracted to him, but wants to try him out since Staffy's her best friend, and she tends to want what her closest friends have. However, he assures her that they aren't dating, but she tells him that if she has her way with him and Staffy finds out, she'll finally throw herself at him, and then they can both be connected through him. Then he tells her that she's clinically insane, but she says her insanity is what inspires her creations and starts to lean in for a kiss, but Tassiliev suddenly comes running through, releases Glenn from her webs, puts him down beside her, and explains that she followed them and heard everything that she said. When she tells her she won't allow her to do what she wants, Orania tells her to stay out of it since it's not her business, but she says that Glenn will court her and take over her family's business. So Orania calls her out for doing the exact same thing as her and only caring about her business which angers her and causes her to charge forward. While Orania jumps out of the way and evades her, and when she lands, she pulls out her scissors to face her head on. Before they collide, Safi appears and pulls Glenn out of the way while she tells them to shut the fuck up, because he doesn't even have the time for courtship or love, as she squeezes him tightly. So he notices that even though she doesn't have the ability to cry, she's been suffering the whole time, and he hadn't even noticed, but he passes out before he can apologize. Later, she apologizes for squeezing too hard, but he says he knows she didn't mean it, and tells her to take it easy on the booze. But when she stares at the mark she left on his neck, she pours another glass, then he asks her if she knew what Arania was planning, and she admits that since she's got a few screws loose, something like this was likely to happen. Suddenly, she confesses that she loves him, which shocks him, but when she says that she doesn't mind if Arania steals him away, he almost chokes on his drink. But she continues and says their hearts could never connect, but that Tassili is her biggest rival since she actually loves him. After hearing this, he rushes his drink, and when he finally responds, he tells her that he's sure she's the only one he can have drinks with, and this somehow makes her happy. But the fairies suddenly leave the room, and when he wonders what's wrong, they suddenly hear a loud explosion and rush outside. There, they see the harpies in the sky and meet the village elder, who tells them that a long time ago, giant gods known as Jigas destroyed everything in their paths till the gods sealed them away in the mountains. However, 300 years ago, their people neglected to make their sacrificial offering, which caused a giant god to appear and destroy the village. And after hearing the reports of the men he sent out earlier, he discovered that another giant god was headed their way. So they all gather to see what's going to happen next, and Glenn admits there's a race called giant gods, but still finds it hard to believe. Suddenly, their structures begin to break down, and they contemplate making a break for it, but they realize they don't have anywhere to go and they can't all fly. So they begin to panic until Tassilia calls their attention, getting them to stay calm while she organizes them. First, she tells Illy to fly to Lindworm and inform them of the situation. Then she tells those who can fly to prepare to head to Lindworm, while she tells Kai and Morna to get the carriage ready. Next, she tells Arania to use her soak to package everyone's belongings compactly, and as he marvels at her leadership skills, she tells him to take care of the flightless harpies that won't be able to fit in the carriage and tells everyone to get to it. So everyone prepares to evacuate and after Glenn sees his last patient, Safi tells them they need to pack out their belongings too, just as another tremor causes their medicines to fall off the shelf, 
but she's able to catch them. Afterward, the villagers start to descend the mountain, and Glenn and Safi follow closely behind. But he notices that Tessalia is nowhere in sight, and he thinks he might know what she's up to. Meanwhile, she heads deep into the forest as she steals her resolve to stall the giant god, so that everyone has enough time to get away. So she promises herself that she'll propose to Glenn if she miraculously survives. But as she laughs to herself, Safi interrupts and tells her to stop the creepy laugh. Then she asks her if she is planning to face the giant god alone, and she confidently says she's the only one who can since she's the strongest. But Safi calls Cap and points out that her ears are trembling, meaning she's scared. But she insists that she's already made up her mind, as Glenn arrives and tells her that as her doctor, he can't just stand by idly. But when she tells them that no one can stop her, Safi says she actually intends to help her. So they begin to bicker again as Tessalia would prefer her to get Glenn to safety. But he says that he has a plan to convince the giant god to not head to the village. Realizing they're all stubborn, they agree to stick it out together, and Tessalia and Safi agree to work together to fight if the conversation goes south, and ready their weapons so that Safi can poison it, while Tessalia strikes. Suddenly, they feel another tremor and quickly advance, but it begins to snow heavily, and Safi starts to struggle with the cold. Then a giant god hand emerges, and they finally come face to face with a giant god woman with long green hair, and Glenn walks forward to raise her up since girls are his specialty. So he pleads with her to spare the villagers and tell them what they might have done to anger her. But before she can respond, she sneezes, which sends him flying back into Safi. Then the giant god says she heard that a doctor was in the village and was hoping he could examine her, and they all marvel at how convenient that it is. Back in Lindorm, Illy reports of the giant god, but when Kunai tells her she must have been having a nightmare, Lady Skadi says she knows of the giant god Dione who lives near the village and that she wouldn't hurt anyone. Back on the mountain, the villagers help to reconstruct the damaged structures as Glenn begins his examination of Dion, but isn't used to seeing all these body parts on a large scale. After looking into her mouth, he tells her she has a cold and a fever, and asks how long she's been feeling sick, and when she says it had been about 10 years, he realizes that it was probably around the time Lindworm was built, and she confirms that it was right after Lady Skady had come to visit her. So he tells her he'll prepare medication for her, but as he tries to move, he conveniently slips right into her god-sized melons, and thanks her for the soft landing. Then he begins to slide deeper into her clothes and she tries to pick him up, but his foot slips out of his sandals and he falls back into heaven. Later the harpies ask where she's been all this time and she says she'd been at the summit of the mountain and it took her so long to get to them because she was avoiding squishing any animals on the way. Meanwhile, as Glenn and Safi hope that the medication they gave is effective on her. The village elder shows up and apologizes for causing such a fuss when the giant goddess turned out to be so kind. So they realize that the old tales must have been wrong and were probably a result of her trying to approach the village. So he suggests they get her warmer clothing so that she doesn't catch another cold and have to visit the village again. So they approach Orania with a task and she gladly takes it up while some harpies drop off materials she can use to make the clothes and Kai and Morna offer to work on her hair. Afterward, they're able to set her up with some warm clothing, and she expresses her gratitude that they still helped her out even though she caused them so much trouble. So they tell her to finish resting in the village before heading back to the summit, and they're finally ready to head back to Lindworm and reopen their clinic. Some days later, Illy visits with a letter from the Central Council, and she tells him she's now working with Scythia Transportation. That night, he meets with Tessalia, and they're glad to see how far Illy has come so he tells her to eat as much as she likes since she was a huge help at the village. But when she starts to lament about how she was ready to risk her life, but didn't get to show her resolve since Dion turned out to be nice, Safi interrupts and tells her to put a sock in it, as she stalks their day from above. And they bicker yet again, however, when Safi says she respects her courage and respects her as a person, which is why she had to stalk their date, to make sure Glenn doesn't fall for her since she's so charming. The next day, they meet Lady Skady and Kunai at the bridge, and thank them for the invite to the waterways commemoration ceremony, then they see Lulala and Arania, and discover they're also pitching in to make the ceremony a success. So Lady Skady expresses her gratitude for everyone's help, and to Glenn for keeping everyone healthy. And as he acknowledges this, he notices something strange about her long golden tail. As the ceremony begins, they notice an empty seat and figure it probably belongs to Dr. Tully, who remains absent from her duties. 
So Lady Skatey gives her speech and explains that she named the city after dragons, to protect it and garner favor from her predecessors in the heavens. But before she can finish the speech, she suddenly passes out. That evening, Glenn and Safi walk through the central hospital, realizing that they've not been there since they opened their clinic. But they find it odd that even though he was the first to attend to Lady Skatey, no one is willing to give him an update, so they plan to visit Dr. Tully, but she warns him not to get carried away by her oversized melons. Then they arrive at her office, so she tells them to come in and immediately grabs Glenn and wraps her tentacles around him, which angers Safi since that's her signature move. So Dr. Tully notices Safi and tells her that she might as well leave. But when she refuses, she lets Glenn go and tells them she's missed them. While Safi says she hasn't stopped her disgraceful behavior around young men, but she claps back and says she's remained as jealous and desperate as ever. When the ladies calm down, she thanks them for attending to Lady Skatey immediately, but when he asks what's wrong with her, she tells them that she can't reveal the details, but that it's a rare illness that she has never heard of before, which has spread throughout her body. Then she mentions that the fluctuations in her blood pressure could lead to heart failure, and since dragons are hard to treat, the case is likely to prove difficult, even for her. But she tells them with nourishment and rest, she'd wake up, but for an actual cure, they'd need to get to the root of the problem. She also tells them that the biggest problem is that Skadi doesn't want to get better, but when she realizes she's revealed enough, she tells them to go back home. Later, he stitches Kunai up as she confirms that Lady Skadi is refusing treatment and plans to resume her duties as the council representative tomorrow. So he confirms that Dr. Tully is unlikely to treat a patient if they refuse it. So Kunai mentions that there might be more to the arrangement since they're also old friends, but that she refuses to sit and watch her suffer after everything she's done for her, and asks him to treat Lady Skadi, even if it means overstepping with Dr. Tully. So he tells her he'd need to conduct an exam, and she tells him that his best bet is to visit her in her bedroom. But this triggers Safi, who knows that he's likely to end up in a suspicious position again. Kunai assures her that it's a more secure option, and would be easier since she'd be wearing less clothing. But the thought of him with a lolly causes Safi to have a mental breakdown since the writers can't resist pleasing the fans. Then, Kunai warns him that treating Lady Skatey's heart would be complicated. That night, they head for her room, and she tells him that he'll have to go inside alone, but she'll rush inside if anything happens. So he enters and finds her staring out the window and calls her attention, but when she tries to respond, he's unable to hear. So she motions for him to come closer, and when he does, he's finally able to hear her, and she asks him why he's there. In response, he explains the situation, and she agrees to let him examine her, but remains confident that he wouldn't be able to cure her. Then she removes her robe and reveals her blue heart sitting right on top of her chest, and this shocks him, so he asks to touch it, and while he does, she says that Dr. Tully called it a malignant tumor that just looks like a heart, but is taking over all her veins and acting like a second heart. As he continues his examination, she tells him her theory that the tumor was a result of dragons leaving heaven and undergoing drastic transformations on earth from their original forms. But he only focuses on continuing to rub her hard and begins to examine the rest of her body, paying extra attention to her tail, which nearly opens her floodgates but when he rubs her wings, she finally releases her gates and falls to the floor crying. Then Kunai walks in to see what's going on and notices Lady Skatey's almost completely undressed. And when Safi sees this too, Kunai promises to take his head off smoothly, while Safi wonders if he'd finally stop cheating on her once he's dead. But she calms them down and tells them she's going to get some rest. The next day, they visit Dr. Tully to ask for assistance with Lady Skatey's surgery, explaining that they need to sever the veins attached to the tumor and immediately reattach them to her heart, which is possible for her since she has many tentacles. So she tells him to come back once he has Lady Skatey's permission but when he asks if she's willing to help him once he convinces her, she reminds him that there are over 100 veins linked to her tumor, and that if it were possible to take care of all the veins, she would have done it already. And even if it were possible, Lady Skadi is only looking for a place to die. After seeing how much this has been affecting her, he tells her that he knows that no one wants to save Lady Skadi more than her, and they're just trying to help. So this moves her and she uses her tentacles to embrace them, which he's already used to, but she also wraps around Safi, showing that she's willing to play for both teams and uses her tentacles to slide deep into her and help her make happy noises. Afterward, Safi's covered in a suspicious sticky substance that's definitely not spider webs, and as Glenn checks on her, 
Dr. Tully says that they'd need more hands to pull it off, especially someone who's not necessarily a doctor, but is used to handling thread and can match her pace. This gives him an idea, and they head to see Arania, who initially declines even though he insists that she's perfect for the job. Meanwhile, the other workers check him out and begin to fall for his doctorese, while Safi barely manages to keep it together. So Arania explains that if she fails, it could affect the reputation of the company, and would prefer to avoid that. But when Safi tells her that she'd get to wear matching uniforms with her if she helps, she immediately agrees. Afterward, they discuss how they've got their work cut out for them for the surgery, starting with convincing Lady Skadi. The next morning, Kanai checks on her, and when she says she's not feeling better, she begs her to have the surgery, but she insists that this is her fate. Meanwhile, Glenn visits a cyclops workshop, where he meets with Memme, who's an airhead with trust issues and isn't used to seeing people with two eyes. So when she mentions that he hardly ever comes directly to the workshop, he says that there's something he needs the boss to make, so they head out, and when he asks how she's doing, she tells him she feels and looks terrible, thanks to her job, and keeps getting run over by carriages. Then, she runs into a large man and falls into his arms, but she panics, and when she tries to move away, her skirt snags on a metal and rips off, revealing her finely made rice cakes, and she slaps him for looking. After covering up, she laments that no one would want to marry her cheap ass now, but they finally reach the boss workshop, and when he sees him, he asks what he needs. So Glenn explains the situation with Lady Skatie's surgery and requests for tools that'll make it possible, and when he says it'll take time and money, he says the central hospital would cover the bills, but they would need the tools within a month. So he accepts the job but says he can't guarantee something as small as a needle, but strong enough to pierce through dragon scales, so he tells Meme to work on the needle, but she suspects that he's only trying to avoid being blamed if the needle causes the surgery to fail. Later, Arania practices her stitching on Kunai, who says she's rougher than Glenn, so she says she's only an amateur and asks Safi to get her a drink since she's tired. But Safi says she'd need to lay off the booze for a while. Then Kunai tells him that Lady Skadi is still being stubborn about the surgery, and when Safi asks why she's so against it, she explains that she's always hated the war between humans and monsters, and felt it was her mission to bring them together. But now that Linworm has become one of the largest cities in the continent, she feels her mission is complete, and it's now her time to go. So Glenn suggests that he go with her to try and convince her again. But Arania says that continuing the same approach will most likely cause her to shut them out and that they need to try coming at her from a different angle, hinting that Glenn should be an expert at it. But when he says he doesn't know what she's talking about, she says that what he does to Safi, which makes her red in the face as she chases after Arania. Later, Dr. Tully and Glenn visit the workshop to inspect the tools for the surgery, and when she tests the surgical knife, she approves it for mass production. But when he spots the needles Mem has been working on, the boss tells him she'll need more time to perfect them. But he really wants her to build her confidence with the job. This causes him to remember his first surgery, which she coached him through and when he tells her that she was pretty hard on them then, she asks him if he would like to suck on her tentacle to feel better. But he refuses to do it in public. Meanwhile, Menmet continues to struggle with making a suitable needle, but as she stands in front of a familiar-looking tool, she realizes she needs it to be harder and gets an idea. Later, Glenn and Safi rush through town, as he remembers that Illy had earlier reported an emergency, saying Menmet had collapsed in the workshop. When they arrive, the boss tells them he had just found her like that, so Glenn rushes to check her breathing, but when she doesn't respond, Safi hands him a pair of scissors to cut through her clothes and free up her plots. However, when he doesn't see any symptoms of an illness, he suggests it could be heat stroke and tells them to get her to the clinic, so the men leave to get a stretcher, while she finally mutters something about completing her needles. While she's in that state, she remembers that she always wanted to be an artisan, but didn't want to make war weapons like axes and knives, which made her glad when Lady Skadi commissioned them to make medical tools that would help to save lives, so she had waited for the perfect opportunity to help her with a job. When she wakes up, she says she needs to get back to work, but he tells her to take it easy and rest, so Arania complains that he's only being nice to her, because her plots are exposed, but when Safi says hers are enough to satisfy him, she shows her that they're not even as big as hers. So Mema asks why she's at the clinic, but suddenly notices that her clothes have been cut open. So he explains that it's just one of the perks of his job, but she gets upset since he already saw her rice cakes without paying. So Arania hands her something to wear 
and he begins her checkup, and when he's done, he asks Safdie to get some herbs, while he tells her that she collapsed from being tipsy. But when she says she wasn't drinking, he explains that hers would be similar to motion sickness, and would involve staring at something with a repetitive back and forth or up and down motion, and asks what she could have possibly been watching. But she says she was only working hard at making needles, so they head back to the workshop to investigate, and she apologizes to the boss for causing everyone to worry, but explains that she's figured out a way to make the needles and shows them the spinning wheel machine, which would be able to stretch the steel into wires that they can cut into needles, making them hard enough, but also easy to produce and replace. So they inspect the needles she's made and agree that they'd be perfect for the surgery. But when Arani appraises her work, she says that she probably has ulterior motives for complimenting her. But they insist that they're genuinely grateful that she'd work so hard at a machine that would make her pass out. So as they leave the workshop, he tells her he'd report to Dr. Tully and should start being more confident from now on, making her red in the face as she runs off, threatening to sue him for his criminally smooth rees. The next day, the Lindworm Council meeting concludes, but as Lady Skady tries to leave, she sees Glenn, who says he's determined to make her change her mind. Later, as he directs Arania on her stitches, Safi reminds him that he's late to the central hospital, so he tells them not to wait up for him, and leaves. Then Arania asks if she's sure she shouldn't just tell him to pay her more attention, but she says she's used to being left behind, and explains that up until she reunited with him in medical school, she was pretty much alone so she's content with waiting for him in the clinic, because she knows he'd always come back. Later, they head out for drinks like old times, except Aselia joins them, and when Arania wonders why, Sapi says she invited her so it could be an official girl's night. But when Arania asks why she's not drinking, she says she doesn't take alcohol and sticks with her juice. Then Tesselia asks if her connection was helpful for Safi, and she says it was, so Arania asks what she means and she explains that they were able to get ingredients to create an anesthetic for Lady Skady, using Tesselia's connections in the East, and discover that their special alcohol can be used as a sedative for dragons, but they're yet to try it out. As Arania goes overboard with her drinking, Tesselia asks if this is usually how she is, but Safi says that it's a bit much even for her, so Tesselia asks her if she remembers when she asked if her love for Glenn was real and when she confirms, she then asks if she even knows what real love is, but she says that she doesn't differentiate between real and fake, and can connect with anyone she wants to with her threads, whether they're male and female, so they look down at their pinkies and see a red thread linking them, and agree that they're now best friends with a suspicious spider woman. Later at the clinic, Orania opens a drawer and takes out a dragon scale, but Safi immediately walks in and tells her she's gotten sloppy with her actions, and isn't trying to use one of her usual excuses, that she calls her out on her other suspicious actions at the clinic, and mentions that she can't allow her to get away with this one. So she tosses the scale in the air and jumps out the window, but when she lands, she sees Tisidalia waiting in front of her, while Safi lands behind her, cornering her in the middle, so she surrenders. Back in the house, she asks them why they're not turning her in even though she stole something, but they say she technically returned it immediately and points out that she's been putting on an act, then Safi says she suspected this might happen since they've been putting her under a lot of pressure, and she admits that trying to steal from the people she's closest to has always been a bad habit of hers, but Safi also mentions that she's also been testing her to see if she'd give up on her friendship by trying to steal Glenn away. So they tell her that there'd be no value in a bond you can make with anyone at any time, and that she needs to learn to trust others and not test the bonds, but strengthen them. After hearing this, she falls down and cries, but when she calms down, she confesses that she tried to take the scale to test Glenn, because she doesn't understand how he manages to teach her kindly after what she did to him and never gets upset when she teases or pranks. As she continues to ramble on about him, Safi tells her she's going to give her an exam and asks if she thinks about him before she sleeps, which she affirms. Then she asks if her chest tightens and she feels warm. And again she says yes, and finally, she asks if she has the urge to tie him up. And when she confirms that too, they begin to laugh, and when she asks what is going on, they tell her that she's in love with Glenn, just like almost every other main character in the anime. Meanwhile, Glenn visits Lady Skady, who's getting sick of seeing his face, so she calls for Kunai to lift her up, but when she realizes that she's not there, he offers to carry her instead. Then she asks if she can tell him why she's refusing the surgery and he tells her to go ahead, 
so she shows him the city that she spent 10 years building, and he agrees that it's one of the best places to live. So she explains that she descended from the heavens to stop the war. And after intervening with the humans for too long, she ended up in her current form. But instead of going back to the heavens to regain her original form, she chose to live among the humans and monsters to observe them for longer. So, after the 100-year war ended, she built the city in hopes that it would never go to war, and gave it a name that means, May the Dragons Protect You. And as the city has continued to thrive, with the humans and monsters even needing each other to survive, she's now content with it and believes her fate has caught up with her. After hearing this, he says her reason is bullshit and that Kunai is always looking out for her, while Dr. Tully is breaking her back to make the surgery a success, and then Man and the others are working day and night to create the tools, while Lulala sings and prays for her recovery. So he encourages her to live longer and continue to watch over the city, as he tells her that her sickness is curable, which means it's not her time. After considering his words, she asks what she says living a long life is boring and wonders what she would do if she stayed alive. So he says she could eat all the sweets that she wants and dress up and buy jewels. So she likes where his head is at and asks what other suggestions he has and when he mentions romance, she can tell where the writers are going with this and asks him to put her down. Then she agrees to do the surgery and tells him she's counting on him. Some days later, Dr. Tully announces the beginning of the surgery while Safi confirms that the anesthesia is working effectively, so Glenn preps himself to begin, while Safi cheers Arania on to calm her nerves. They head to work, and Safi disrobes her while Dr. Tully goes in with the knife, causing her veins to glow. Then they prepare their stitching materials as she tells them Lady Skadi's true form allowed her to breathe fire using flammable gases that are within her, which is the reason why her internal organs are blue. So as they continue the surgery, she tells them it's time to remove the tumor, but Safi suddenly notices a spike in her body temperature and blood pressure, and when Glenn takes a look, her body begins to glow, and Dr. Tully explains that fire dragons can spontaneously combust when they sense their lives are in danger. So she tells Safi and Arania to step back while she and Glenn try to remove the tumor, but the materials begin to burn, including her tentacles. So she tells him to get it out quickly while she restrains her, so he begins to cut through while the rest of the town waits outside with lanterns, hoping for her recovery. The next day, Lady Skady appears before the town, removes her mask, and is finally able to address the people with her own voice, so she tells them she'd give her all to the city, and they cheer her on. Then she turns to Kunai and asks where Glenn is, but she says that he's looking after Safi since she's feeling under the weather, so Lady Skady decides to go to him, and when Kunai asks what about the ceremony, she says she intends to do whatever she wants from now on. Back at the clinic, Glenn helps warm up her tail, but when she notices that she's refusing to speak, he asks her to open her mouth and shoves his finger inside to inspect it, and when he pulls out her tongue, she realizes this the closest she's going to get to first base. She decides to enjoy it as he rubs honey on her, making her wet. When he's done, she rests and tells him he took too long, and his face was too close to hers, making her embarrassed, so things get awkward. Then he says he has a couple of house calls to make, but says they should have dinner when he gets back. So he heads into town and finds Lady Skadi and Kunai having trouble with their carriage, but when she spots him, she hugs him and tells him they're going on a romantic date while calling him her big brother. But he tells her that he has a house call to make, just as Kunai carries her far from him, asking why she's suddenly acting clingy with him. So she says it's because he cured her and opens her robes to give him a good view. But when she asks if that excited him, he says he's not in the mood and helps her button up her clothes while she insists that they go out together. Once she's fully dressed, Kunai tells her she can't do as she pleases if it'll interfere with his work, and he tells her he's sorry to disappoint her, but he has to attend to a patient. At this moment, Memin walks by, and when she sees the issue with her carriage, she says she can help and brings out her tools, and in no time, she gets it back to normal. So Lady Skady thanks her for saving her once again, but Memes says that she's useless and anyone could have done it, and asks if they're planning to bill her. After they assure her there are no hidden costs, Lady Skady tells Kunai to give them their gifts, so they leave them with two large barrels of wine and ride off. When he wonders how he's going to get it home, he realizes he's late for his house call and tells Mehmet to watch his barrel till he gets back and runs off too. Then Lulala shows up and asks if she has a drinking problem. But when Mehmet tries to explain the situation, she realizes she doesn't care and swims off, leaving Mehmet more confused than usual. Meanwhile, the house, Arania undresses Safi and wraps her arms all around her. 
but when she points out that something seems sus about their position, Arania says she's only looking after her since she's sick. Once she's dressed, Arania suggests they make dinner for Glenn, and she agrees. On the mountain, Dion helps the villagers remove a boulder from the river, so they thank her and offer her some food from their harvest, which reminds her that she also brought them food from the summit, and she whips out a giant fruit tray. Back in the city, Med Meg continues to mumble to herself while she waits by the barrels. Then Glenn arrives with Desaldi Kai and Lorna to help carry the barrels, so she gets into the carriages and Lorna carries her back to the workshop. Then Tesalia and Kai leave together, and Kai tells him that he's really special, since he has the nerve to call Tesalia to personally transport something for him. But Tesalia says that she's honored that he's relying on her, and doesn't mind since they're soon to be family. So Kai suggests that they pick a date for their engagement, but says that he's not interested in engagements yet since he has so many options. At that moment, he spots the cowgirl he first treated, and when he sees that she's given birth, he hopes he's not the father. Meanwhile, the girls wait for him to return, as Safi worries that someone else might be hitting on him. So Arania says he's probably rising up another baddie, but they suddenly see Illy at the window, and she drops off food from the village's harvest and asks where Glenn is, but almost immediately, he comes through the door, and all the girls rush to his side. But Safi pushes past them and asks what took him so long, so he shows them all the food he brought back with him and explains that all his former patients kept handing him food on the way home. Just as she asks what the hell they're supposed to do with all the food, Lady Skady and Kunai also appear and hand him some dragon dumplings. But before he can thank them, the Cyclops from the workshop also show up and say it would be more fun if they drank together. So with the excess food and drink, they decide to host a party with all the monsters getting along. Then Arania says she now understands how much Safi has been suffering. And Tessalia points out that they have another worthy opponent, as they all look toward Lady Skady as he approaches her. So she thanks him for helping to see the world differently and gets closer to him. But Safi immediately grabs him and questions him for not giving her enough alone time. So she tries to lick him. But Tessalia comes between them, and then the rest of the harem joins in to try and steal him away. Will Glenn finally find a patient he can't treat? If you made it this far, confuse the fake fans by typing Rip Lady Skady in the comments. See you in the next one.